Hello, Claire Kyle. I'm very happy to meet you here in my home office. Um, you are a reader in philosophy and theology at the King's College in London. You were also in the University of Liverpool where you have organized the philosophy in the city. And now you have written three books about Kierkegaard. And one of this is a biography of Søren Kierkegaard, 1813 to 1855 which has been translated in Germany by Ursula Held and Sieg, Siegfried Schmidt and published by Klett Kotter under the title Die, Der Philosoph des Herzen, Das Rastlose Leben der Sören Kierkegaard. How did you come across to Kierkegaard and why is he so fascinating for you? Uh, well, I discovered him when I was a philosophy student at university to begin with and read Kierkegaard alongside many other philosophers at that time and just was very interested in, in all kinds of, all different, all different kinds of philosophy. Um, but Kierkegaard did stand out to me as particularly interesting. His literary style is so interesting and unusual. And I found his ideas just very exciting. And I had a great teacher at, 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 in Cambridge, one of my philosophy teachers, was a Kierkegaard expert. So he was very inspiring and I decided to, to stay on in Cambridge and write a PhD on Kierkegaard. So then I ended up really focusing on, on Kierkegaard's works for mm -hmm. three or four years. In Kierkegaard's case, his writings are closely linked to his origins, his family, his relationship with his father, and especially mm -hmm. to those who have influenced him. Does the biography contribute to a better understanding of his work? <laughs> well, um, I certainly found myself that writing the biography, I got, I reached a better understanding of Kierkegaard's works through writing the biography and through thinking about Kierkegaard's life. Um, obviously, there are several biographies already out there. So the facts of Kierkegaard's life are already quite well known. My biography doesn't make new factual discoveries, but I do offer a new interpretation of the, the meaning of, of Kierkegaard's life. So I was particularly interested in thinking about his inner life, um, as, as was he. <laughs> he. He was so interested in human subjectivity, in inwardness, in the experience of being the person that each of us is. And so in my biography, I was trying to understand the inwardness of Kierkegaard, his own inner experience. And so I think I have interpreted that inner experience in a new way, in a way that, that, that perhaps reveals perhaps a new emotional truth about Kierkegaard, if not, a, if not new facts about his, mm -hmm. his life. All his work is dedicated to the question of what is man? What is a man in the world? Did he ever give an answer that satisfied him or was a search of what a man is the core in his work? Well, the search was essential. It was the core and he was really influenced by Socrates who, as Kierkegaard said, Socrates devoted himself to the question what is a human being? How do I become a human being? And so that idea of being devoted to a question and to a search is really important in Kierkegaard's philosophy. That's not to say he doesn't come up with any answers at all. He, one of the most important aspects of the answer to, to that question is for Kierkegaard, the idea that a human being is related to God. So mm -hmm. for Kierkegaard, a human being is a spiritual being has a relationship to God. Obviously, that you could say that's an answer to the question, but it opens up many new questions like, what is God? <laughs> um, what does it mean to say that you're a spiritual being? And so these are very large and open, open questions. And I think Kierkegaard's writing opens up this space for exploring those, those existential spiritual questions about what it is to be a human being. Mm -hmm. Either or appears under the pseudonym Victor Eremita. Why did he use so many pseudonyms? Did he want to hide himself? Many knew how 
was hiding behind the pseudonyms. Yeah, so so it was quite most people knew that Kierkegaard was behind his pseudonym. So I don't think the main reason was to conceal his identity. Having said that, Kierkegaard did have quite a complicated relationship to the public, and he found that that experience of being exposed to public judgment, being seen, um, being in the public eye, he did find that difficult. So I think his pseudonyms were one way of, of dealing with that experience of being in the public view, but also they are there for literary reasons and for philosophical reasons. They're not so much, it's not just about him disguising himself, it's rather that he creates these pseudonyms, these different voices to embody different ways of looking at life, different um, existential postures, different attitudes, different perspectives, um, and to, to sometimes criticize those perspectives. So sometimes mm -hmm. the pseudonym might be voicing a position or voicing embodying a perspective that Kierkegaard thinks is limited and he wants to expose the limitations of that perspective so it's just like in in fiction you know the characters have have different literary functions within a within a plot within a mm -hmm. text and and so Kierkegaard's pseudonyms have functions within his philosophical system that he's mm -hmm. creating through his writing. He was at odds with the modern or contemporary practices of Christianity. Mm -hmm. What specifically bothered him? Yeah, he was very critical of contemporary or 19th century Christianity. He thought it was too comfortable, too complacent, um, too conventional and too easy. He thought that his contemporaries preached this quite consoling, comforting version of Christianity that he saw as too far removed from the radical and subversive message of the New Testament and of the kind of life choices and the risks that Jesus and his disciples took. Kirchhoff thought that that element of, of risk, scandal, had just been taken out of Christianity by the 19th century and, and, and it was too conformist, comfortable, complacent. So he wanted to shake up and disrupt that Christian culture that he thought was kind of sleepy and... Um, your, yeah. your chapter, The Half Philosophers Again, contains a remarkable insight into Kierkegaard's work. I quote, the idea that every person is that individual becomes increasingly clear in his work. Among mm -hmm. other things, he was also concerned with the individual, which mm. is actually a very modern concept, isn't it so? Yes, it is, yeah. And Kierkegaard is one of, perhaps one of the philosophers who is responsible for that kind of modern individualism. It's often seen as part of existentialism and the idea of authenticity, that each individual has to be authentically themselves. And so you can trace those ideas to Kierkegaard's work and sometimes he's criticized for being too individualistic um, because of his emphasis on, on yeah, subjectivity and on the individual. So it, it is an important element of, of key mm. thoughts, yeah. His engagement to Regina Olsen on 10 September 1840, which he broke off 13 months later, had an impact on his whole life, mm. which is effects and memories. It's affected him. And later he realized that he couldn't only develop in his way because of her. There are many essays and even books about this engagement and the spoken engagement. Can you understand the decision to break this engagement? <laughs> yeah, it's difficult, it's difficult. Kierkegaard kept rewriting the story, rewriting the narrative of the broken engagement. I think he was trying to understand it himself again and again, and he kept returning to it in his writing. Um, in, in the book, I was quite cautious about speculating and giving a theory. I, di I, didn't, I, di I don't have a definite theory such as, you know, Kierkegaard was homosexual or he has some kind of sexual problem or he was too depressed and that was why he couldn't be married. Um, there was some dark secret that was hidden in his past and 
he himself talked about some kind of, well, he called it the thorn in the flesh. He talked about some kind of characteristic that he saw as an affliction, something that stopped him from marrying. Um, but he was, it was important to him to keep that secret. And I wanted to respect that mm -hmm. right. and, 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 not, and not kind of construct my own, my own theory. So I tried to let the reader see what the questions were, see perhaps what the possibilities are without me making my judgments about that question. But it's, it is, I think it is the question that really drove his authorship of the broken engagement and, and, and why that was and what it was about himself, who he was, um, that was just so important to, to his life. Mm -hmm. You keep telling about his doubt, doubts, but they were not really writing inhibitions because can one say he freed himself by writing? Yeah, he certainly wasn't inhibited as a writer. He didn't suffer from writer's block. <laughs> um, he, he wrote pages and pages and pages every day and was really a compulsive writer. In fact, while some writers str might struggle with writer's block, Kierkegaard struggled to stop writing. Sometimes he tried to stop writing and he found it really difficult to, to do that. So yeah, I think writing was Kierkegaard's way of understanding himself um, living out his own relationship to himself, perhaps performing his own identity, uh, you know, in, in, in his social world, writing was really, I think, the, the one thing in Kierkegaard's life that was the, the one thing that was most important to him out of, out of everything was, was his writing. It was his vocation. Mm -hmm. Actually, Kierkegaard was a loner, but his work grew in contact and confrontation with so many who impressed him encouraged him and criticized him, Johann Ludwig Heiberg or Hans Lassen Martensen and other. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, he was actually, I mean, Kierkegaard is a very contradictory character. So later in his life, he did get a reputation for being a loner and being reclusive, but he could also be very sociable. He loved to go out and talk to people. He was a familiar figure on the streets of Copenhagen. He you know, bring, go for walks with people and have these great conversations. And so he was in some ways a, a sociable person. And certainly, I mean, like, like most writers and thinkers, he was really influenced by his enemies <laughs> as well as by his teachers. Mm -hmm. um, absolutely, yeah. Part two of your biography deals with Kierkegaard's origins, the memories of his father, family life, his siblings, the parental home and need of. Why was the influence of this father well-meaning and destructive, come how you write, so yes. this decisive, decisive for Kierkegaard's life? Mm. Well, I think it's the same for everybody, isn't it? We, we all are influenced by our parents. I think that's just part of what it is to be a, a human being, you know, that my, my mother is, I can't imagine myself without thinking of, of my mother and I think for Kierkegaard, you know, his father, was of course so such a powerful influence on him. His father was interested in philosophy. He was quite an intellectual person, but he wasn't educated. He was the son of a peasant. He'd gone into business and actually made a lot of money. So Kierkegaard then was able to have this great university education, but his father didn't have that. His father embodied a certain kind of Christianity that was extremely influential for Kierkegaard. Kierkegaard talked about the fact that his father made him very ambivalent about Christianity because he found he found that the, the kind of religion that his father practiced was something that he found terrifying and caused him a lot of anxiety. But he was also really drawn to that religion. So he had he he had a he had this this deep ambivalence towards Christianity. And I think it was his father's influence that that. Not, not deliberately, you know, his father didn't try to make him ambivalent, but in the end, you know, I think that, that ambivalence was something that he really, he really did take from his father and it shaped his whole thinking, his whole life, his relationship to himself, to other people, definitely. In 1848, he published Christian speeches, 28 sermons to compete with Bishop Minster, <laughs> whom he knew from his youth. A disagreement begins which will never be finally resolved, is a house of the Lord or a house of illusions, you write. 
This is how to interpre interpret this confrontation with the church. Yes, yeah. So, so Kierkegaard's confrontation with the church, on the one hand, he was criticizing a whole kind of religious culture that, as I've described before, this complacency, but it was also very personal. So the head of the Danish church was this bishop, Bishop Munster, who um, Kierkegaard's father had really liked and Kierkegaard had known Bishop Munster since he was a teenager. And so it was, it was very a personal attack. Um, only in the middle of his career did Kierkegaard actually begin to attack Munster. He, 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 for, for, for much of his time, he was very respectful towards him, but then it was a big turning point when he decided to come out in opposition to Munster. And it was something that he found, I think, quite terrifying to do that, to sort of step out and stand against this, this very respected bishop, the leader of the church, absolutely. And so the whole drama of Kierkegaard's life is really played out against figures like Munster, you know, these, these, these well-known mm -hmm. figures. Kierkegaard then stood up, um, put himself in opposition to, to, to Munster and also to Munster's successor, Martinson, um, who was Kierkegaard's rival throughout his life. And then when Munster died, Martinson became the head of the church and was really somebody who, who was, I think, really an enemy. He was, he was Kierkegaard's main enemy, that the two men um, were really made life difficult for each other. Yeah. <laughs> The chapter of aesthetic education occupies a special place in your book because it tells how Kierkegaard applies his knowledge and methods to the interpretation of the case. Here, the actress Johann Luise Heiberg. Mm -hmm. The chapter is followed by an account of the influence of the German romantics of Kierkegaard. Why, which of Kierkegaard's works should be one read again in order to trace these traces and influences in his work? Um, well, I suppose either or is a book that has a lot of influence of German romanticism, but as you say in that chapter, I focused on something that Kierkegaard wrote, which isn't very well known, which is a, about a, a piece, a journalistic piece that he published in a, in a newspaper about the most famous actress in Denmark, Johan Louise Heiberg. And, and, uh, and it's a really interesting essay because he talks about what it's like for a woman to be growing older and to be in the public eye. Um, so there's all these reflections on, on sort of feminine experience as, as well as what, it, what it's like to be an artist and how you grow as an artist. And so he's both reflecting on himself, but he's also reflecting on this, this woman, this, this great actress who's in the middle of her career. And so that's a really good example of his interest in art and in, in creativity, which of course were these very important themes for the romantics, yeah, the idea that art and human creativity were, could, be, could be at the center of life, could be um, really at the root of, of life's meaning and, and truth, yeah. And there's also a demarcation from the future existentialists. Man is not prefabricated, but he does not create himself either. Mm. And that, that is how they understand Kierkegaard's reflections actually quite similar to how Albert Camus formulates it. Man faces the world, asks his questions, but the world is irrationally silent. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, Kierkegaard was shown with his complete works, how man can very, fell, very well define, indeed create himself. Yes, that's right, yeah. So as you say, on the one hand, we don't completely create ourselves and yet we we have we still have to make ourselves in the world so and that's absolutely as you say very central to that existentialist insight i mean the way martin heidegger puts it is that you're you're thrown into the world we just kind of find ourselves thrown and but then once we're once we're thrown we then have this ethical existential task of becoming ourselves and that's really a key existentialist thought that yes, you can trace trace to Kierkegaard absolutely. Obviously, for Kierkegaard as a as a Christian thinker, a religious thinker, he would emphasise this idea that human beings are created by God ultimately, um, and so that that kind of creative process of becoming a self is like a collaboration between God and the human being, whereas the later existentialists were would reject that 
you know, mm -hmm. Christian or theistic view and, and have a different take on it, but they're still thinking about that problem of to what to, to what extent are we create can we create ourselves and to what extent are we just falling into the world having to having to deal with our facticity as as you know Sasha would put it absolutely yeah. your whole book is a very fine answer to the question why should we rediscover Kierkegaard today mm -hmm. but what would you say <laughs> in two sentences <laughs> well I mean I don't know what why why read any book I mean why why read any philosophy because I think because we're curious about it um yeah I mean as uh, as you've said Kiko is someone who really pursues this question of what does it mean to be a human being and he doesn't ask that as an abstract theoretical question it's like he asks it from the inside um, it's a question that arises within his own experience. And I think for anybody who has that same experience of that question, Kierkegaard is a great guide in exploring that question. So, yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much for your answers. Your book um, with the German title Der Philosoph des Herzen has been published by Klett Cotter in this autumn. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the uh, questions. Thank you.